Hello, and welcome to the Royal Astronomical Society's online public talk and live, st live stream. I am Lucinda Offer, Education Outreach and Bicentenary Events Officer for our 200th anniversary of the Royal Astronomical Society, who has advanced astronomy, geophysics, and space science since 1820. And I am so excited to be hosting our bicentenary public talk today, Happy Birthday Hevel, with Dr. Stephen Wilkins from the University of Sussex, where he's a reader in astronomy and an STFC public engagement fellow. His research mostly focuses on understanding the formation of the first stars and galaxies through both space-based observations and computer simulations. A little reminder for tonight, if you would like to get your questions ready, feel free to post them to the Zoom chat Q&A or to the YouTube chat box and they will be answered at the end of this talk. Thank you, Dr. Wilkins, for being with us tonight, celebrating 200 years of the Royal Astronomical Society and honoring the Hubble Space Telescope, which was launched 30 years ago today. On to you. Thank you, Lucinda. And thank you everybody for listening in today. So I'm Dr. Stephen Wilkins from the University of Sussex. And today I'm gonna to talk about Happy Birthday Hubble, celebrating 30 years of the Hubble Space Telescope. But before I start onto my talk, I'm just gonna introduce myself very briefly. So I was born in Yorkshire I was then an undergraduate student in physics and astronomy at the University of Durham. I then went to the University of Cambridge where I did my PhD in astronomy. I then spent three and a half years at the University of Oxford as a researcher. And now a little bit more than seven years ago, I moved to the University of Sussex where I became a lecturer, then senior lecturer, and now reader in astronomy. I'm also currently the director of outreach and public engagement for the School of Mathematical and Physical Sciences at Sussex and also an SDFC Public Engagement Fellow. Um, I'll be honest, a couple of years before I moved to Sussex, I actually didn't know where Sussex was. Um, I think my knowledge of most UK counties is actually pretty poor. But for those of you in the same, um, same boat as I was, Sussex is down here. So this is a map of the British Isles as it appeared a little bit more than a thousand years ago when Sussex actually was its own kingdom surrounded by Wessex and Kent. Ultimately, we know that Sussex got absorbed into Wessex, which later became England. The places in Sussex, which are the most famous, are the seaside town of Brighton, very known, well known for being one of the most progressive parts of the country and having the country's only green MP. So Brighton is very famous for its pier, and some of its architecture, including the Royal Pavilion here. Just outside Brighton and really dominating the rest of Sussex is the South Downs National Park, which has a landscape like this. So lots and lots of green rolling hills. Now these hills will also intersect the coastline, so now the English Channel. And as they do this, they expose the chalk from which the hills are made out of. So we can see this beautiful image. This is the Seven Sisters and Cookmere Haven in East Sussex. But today I'm going to talk about the Hubble Space Telescope and I'm going to split my talk into four bits. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the history of the Hubble Space Telescope, um, what Hubble is doing today, and then some of the science. I'm not going to be able to talk about all of the science of Hubble, so I'm just going to pick out some of my favourites. And then I'm going to talk about the future of the Hubble Space Telescope and its successes as well. Okay, so what is Hubble's history? Well, the idea for a space observatory really goes back to shortly after the Second World War, when the American astronomer Lyman Spitzer, who you can see here, actually proposed the idea. He wrote an article where he actually outlined why it would be good to have a space-based observatory. Now, one of the main reasons why Spitzer believed this was that a space-based observatory could overcome the adverse effects of the Earth's atmosphere. And in particular, this would enable observations at wavelengths which are not normally uh, accessible from the ground. So in this diagram, what I'm showing is how opaque the atmosphere is as a function of wavelength. Okay, so this tells us what fraction of light falling on the top of the atmosphere actually makes it down to the ground. And what we can see is that in the X-rays in the UV, only a tiny fraction makes it down to the ground, which makes astronomy impossible at those wavelengths. But in the visible and more so in the radio, the atmosphere becomes transparent, allowing us to do astronomy. The fact that we have this wide gap in the radio as well, where atmosphere is transparent, enables a lot of our modern technology. So things like Wi-Fi and cellular communications, 
which I'm sure many people are using right now. We can see the infrared is a little bit mixed in that some makes it through the atmosphere, but actually the, the vast majority of it doesn't. And so with the advent of spaceflight in the light, late 1950s, this idea was actually very soon realized. So Spitzer came up with this just after the Second World War in the late 40s. It was only a decade before we had the first space probes. And we only had to wait a few years later before we had the first space observatories. So you could argue about the definitions here, but probably the first real space observatory was the US's orbiting solar observatory program. This was actually a small space telescope designed to study the sun. Now this was very shortly followed by the UK's first satellite, which was also a solar observatory, the Ariel 1 probe, which was launched in 1962. Both of these programs actually consisted of several different satellites, which went up over the, the following few years. Um, and in the end, they observed the sun at various wavelengths, which were inaccessible from the ground, and eventually even observed other objects. So they did effectively become real astronomical observatories. And so the image you can see here is actually a model of Ariel 1, which I believe currently sits in the Science Museum in London. Now, the OSA program was succeeded, beginning in 1966, by a US-led orbiting astronomical observatory program. This was really an idea to actually build something that didn't just look at the sun, but also looked at other objects. And so this program actually consisted of four satellites, of which only two were actually successful. Although this doesn't seem like a very good return, actually, because we're right at the beginning of spaceflight here, this was actually really, really positive. So what we can see here is an artist impression of the first of these satellites in orbit. And you can see that this is starting to, to resemble the kind of familiar shape that we've seen of Hubble. Now the OAO program finished with OAO3, which was launched in late 1972. And this actually proved to be the most successful of the OAO missions. Now this mission itself was actually a collaborative effort between NASA and the UK Science Research Council which is now transformed into the Science and Technologies Facilities Council, along with a few other councils as well. And again, the picture that we can see here, this is um, OAO3 in its clean room, so it's now a real picture. And again, it's looking more like Hubble. So we can see the solar panels here, we can see where the light goes in at the top of the telescope, and then the rest of the body of the telescope will be the instrumentation, including the cameras. Now the OAO program actually focused on observing wavelengths of light which are heavily blocked by the Earth's atmosphere. So things like the UV and the X-rays. But there are also good reasons to have a visible or optical space observatory as well. So while most of the visible light is able to pass through the Earth's atmosphere, as it does, it's distorted and it's spread out. Now this makes it very difficult to resolve small features and observe very faint objects. This isn't really a concern for very small telescopes, which are limited by diffraction, basically their own optics, their own size. But once we start building bigger telescopes of the order of a couple of meters in diameter, as we were doing in the 60s and 70s, this is now becoming an issue. And so we can see the effects of the atmosphere in these two little animations here. So on the left hand side, we have just one portion of the moon, which has been imaged several times in, in close succession, just showing what the atmosphere is doing to the image of the moon. So we can see that the shapes of the craters are getting distorted. And then on the right hand side, we have an image of a star. And we can see that the light from that star is being moved around the detector, but it's also very blurry. It's not a nice point source. And although this is partly due to the diffraction in the telescope itself, a lot of it in this case is due to the atmosphere moving things around. And so for this reason, if we really want to see very faint things and objects in much more detail, it does make sense to go above the atmosphere. And so the success of the OAO program and the growing need to overcome the blurring effects of the Earth's atmosphere led to the development of what was then called the Large Space Telescope or LST. So the original idea for this envisioned a three meter diameter telescope with a launch slated for the late 1970s. Now, to extend its lifetime, LST was designed to be maintained and crewed by the reusable space shuttle. So the space shuttle was also in development at the same time. So LST and later Hubble's development went hand in hand with the space shuttle. In fact, there was lots of synergy between the two. Unfortunately, LST failed to generate sufficient political support. And in the mid 1970s, the project was almost entirely abandoned due to very vast public spending cuts in the US. 
But through a lobbying effect, effort by astronomers, support grew and funds were eventually made available. But this came with a price. We had to have a smaller telescope down at 2.4 meters and with a launch date a few years later in 1983. But luckily for us here in the UK, these funding issues in the US also prompted collaboration with the European Space Agency. So the European Space Agency, which is our space agency, they agreed to provide one of the first generation instruments as well as the solar cells. And what you can see in the image here is actually this first generation camera, the faint object camera, being removed in 2002 to make way for the advanced camera for surveys. And this really sets the scene of the next few slides as I'll talk about how Hubble was updated and maintained over its lifetime. At this point, LST was renamed in honor of Edwin Hubble, an American astronomer who was very active in the 1920s to 40s. Hubble is perhaps most well known beyond the naming, namesake of the telescope as one of the astronomers which really um, showed us that our universe is expanding. Okay, that our universe isn't just static, that it's been expanding and it's been around for a finite amount of time. So at this point, LST becomes the Hubble Space Telescope. And so if we look at the design of the Hubble Space Telescope, it looks like this. So we have that light enters the telescope on the far left. It travels down the telescope to around halfway. It gets reflected off a primary mirror, which has the effect of bringing the light to a focus. Okay, just like our eyes and just like most other telescopes. So the light is then sent back up the telescope. In order to send it back down to the instruments, there is a secondary mirror, which is about halfway back up again. So then the light reflects off the secondary mirror and goes back down into the bottom of the telescope where the instrumentation is kept. Now the instrumentation down here includes all of Hubble's cameras, but also many of the critical components for communicating that data back to the Earth as well. And then we also see that there's a communications antennae. Okay? Obviously, we need to get the images that Hubble takes back down to the Earth. And then also we can see the solar panels, which provide Hubble with its power. And you can really get an idea of the scale of Hubble here with the comparison with the, the human figure down at the bottom right. Okay, So we see that Hubble is kind of the size of a, of a small single-decker bus. Now, Hubble was developed mostly in the very early 1980s and late 1970s. And actually, by January 1986, a planned launch that year looked viable, it looked feasible. Unfortunately, later in January that year, the Special to Challenger broke apart shortly after launch, and the entire crew was lost. As the Space Shuttle was really integral to Hubble's launch, Challenger's loss placed the mission in serious jeopardy. But shuttle flights did eventually resume in 1988, and the Hubble Space Telescope was launched on the Space Shuttle Discovery, now 30 years ago today, on the 24th of April, 1990. So what you can see in the picture here is the actual launch of Hubble in 1990. So this is the Space Shuttle Discovery lifting off. Hubble was deployed the following day. So this is now Hubble being released from the special tool for the first time, but obviously not the last time. I really like this picture because we can see reflected in Hubble's effectively lens cover, the earth and the clouds. But Hubble's problems didn't end with launch. Soon after the launch, it was realized that there was a serious problem with Hubble. Hubble's image quality was actually much worse than expected. <coughs> Sorry, bless me. <laughs> Hubble's image quality was much worse than expected, potentially compromising much of the planned scientific analysis. So what we can see on the right here is an image of a relatively nearby galaxy taken by Hubble only a couple of years after launch. Now, this image is nowhere near as good as it was expected. In fact, it's not hugely better than the types of images we were able to take from the ground around the same time. And so there was a lot of disappointment, but, we were soon able to track down the, the, the cause of this problem. And it actually turned out to be the mirror. It was realized that the mirror had been ground very precisely to the wrong shape, okay? The reason for this is actually quite interesting. It's because the device which was used to test how accurate the mirror was, was actually incorrectly assembled. So it's not that the mirror wasn't checked, it's that the device used to check the mirror was actually flawed. This is kind of like trying to precisely measure um, a piece of furniture 
using a ruler which has not been calibrated, where maybe somebody's just drawn on the marks by hand. And so because of this, it was impossible for us to actually get the mirror that we needed. However, Hubble was always designed to be serviceable. And in 1993, Servicing Mission 1 installed a new system called CoStar that was designed to correct this problem. At the same time, a new suite of instruments were also installed. And those new instruments, including Wide Field Camera 2, actually were designed um, to, by themselves, mitigate the effect of, of Hubble's deformed mirror. But one of the downsides of this was that this actually required sacrificing one of the science instruments. So some of the early science that Hubble could have done was sacrificed because of this problem. But it is great that it was able to be fixed. And so we can see here the before and after pictures of this same galaxy M100. So on the left, we have before servicing mission one, and on the right, we have after servicing mission one. And you can see the image quality is now dramatically increased. Now, up until 2002, Hubble was serviced the further three times. During these servicing missions, broken parts were replaced, new instruments were installed, and the orbit was boosted. The reason why the orbit needs to be boosted is because Hubble is in relatively low Earth orbit. So it orbits above the Earth's surface at about 500 kilometers. And at this point, there's still enough of the Earth's atmosphere that it produces a drag effect on the telescope. Now, if left alone, this drag effect would slowly make Hubble lose altitude over time. And so every time it's been serviced now, it's been boosted up to a higher orbit, which extends its lifetime further. But this maintenance of Hubble was really maintained the entire observatory as a state-of-the-art observatory. And as I'll mention again later, as to this day, probably the most premier and still in most in-demand observatory that we have. Hubble was actually due to be serviced for a fifth time in 2005. Unfortunately, there was a second special disaster in 2003, only a couple of years before. This is when the Columbia special tool was lost on re-entry. Now, with the Columbia disaster, this caused future manned missions to the Hubble to be cancelled. However, it actually didn't cause the special tool missions themselves to be fully cancelled. But there was this requirement that in case of emergency, astronauts should be able to reach the International Space Station. But unfortunately, this isn't possible from Hubble's orbit. But due in part to leadership changes at NASA and political and public support, and I think really crucially support from the astronauts themselves, this decision was ultimately reversed and a final servicing mission, servicing mission four, took place in 2009. So what we can see here is an image of the astronauts during this, this final servicing mission of Hubble. Okay, so you can see them and you can get an idea of the scale of Hubble here by seeing them compared to the telescope. Now this mission involved critical repairs as well as the installation of two new instruments. These included Whitefield Camera 3, which is Hubble's most versatile and advanced camera. This camera is actually very, very close to my own heart because it was with the installation of this camera that I started working on Hubble. And I'll mention a bit more about my science later. Okay, so we can see this camera down here. This is a single camera and you can see it compared to the engineers and technicians around it. So this is Hubble during servicing mission four, connected to the space shuttle for the last time. This is one of my favorite images, an image that I've used a lot in the past. So what we can see here is a pair of astronauts with one astronaut taking the picture of the other astronaut. But because of the reflectivity of the target astronaut's visor, we can see the photographer in the reflection. But what's really nice is if we look behind the photographer, we can see the Hubble Space Telescope, but we can also see the Earth. So lots and lots of features in here. And then this is one of our final close-ups of Hubble shortly after it was released. And this will be the final time that we get close to the telescope. So what about Hubble today? Well, Hubble is now 30 years old. But despite being surpassed in size by a long way by ground-based telescopes, Hubble's vantage point above the atmosphere means it remains one of the world's premier and most in-demand observatories. So what I'm comparing it here with is the Very Large Telescope. And these are not the same size as in the image. They're not to the scale here. The Very Large Telescopes themselves have a diameter of eight meters or a little bit more than eight meters. And so each one of these buildings that you can see here 
is about the same size as a, the kind of height of a football stadium. In fact, the building at the, the lower left-hand corner of the image, this is actually a four or five-story building. Today, Hubble has four instruments, wide field camera three, the cosmic origin spectrograph, the advanced camera for surveys, the space telescope imaging spectrograph. Now these combined provide imaging and spectroscopy across not only the visible spectrum, but much of the ultraviolet and a small bit of the infrared as well. So this is capability that Hubble didn't have at the originally. This is capability that has been added to Hubble over its lifetime, just expanding its capabilities. So now I'm going to talk about some of the science that Hubble has done over its lifetime. So Hubble's ability to probe across the UV, the visible and the near infrared, and its position above the atmosphere make it really suited to a huge range of science. This is one of the reasons why it is in such demand. Lots and lots of astronomers want to use it to look at their favourite phenomenon, to answer their science questions. Today, Hubble is used to find and study the most distant objects in the universe, which is my own science area but also to study our own solar system. Here on the right hand corner is just about my favorite Hubble image of all time. This is the Pillars of Creation. What this is, is a relatively nearby region of star formation in our own galaxy. And so what's happening in these pillars of gas and dust is that new planets and stars are forming. So some of the science themes that Hubble has tackled over its lifetime include the age of the universe, the accelerating expansion, the exploration of the solar system, the deep fields and most recently distant worlds. In fact, this is only a small amount of the science that Hubble has done, but these are the ones that I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail because personally I find them some of the most interesting. So the age of the universe. Well, we've known since the 1920s and 30s, in part due to Hubble the person, that our universe is expanding and therefore that it's only been around a finite amount of time. Now, before Hubble was launched, the telescope that is, not the, not the person, scientists actually predicted the age of the universe ranging from around 10 to 20 billion years. Thanks in large part to Hubble, but also other missions, the estimated age of the universe today is around 13.8 billion years with an uncertainty of only a few hundred million years. Actually being able to constrain the age of the universe is really, really important because that same information that we use to constrain the age of the universe tells us about what the universe contains. And this brings us on to the next part, the accelerating expansion. Supernovae are some of the most luminous explosions or phenomenon to take place in the universe. They happen at the end of some stars' lifetimes. These are often so bright that we can see them very, very far away, okay? But they do only last for a few days. What I'm showing you in this image here is a supernova exploding in a relatively distant galaxy, okay? And this supernova is the object down at the bottom left-hand corner. This is a single star exploding in this galaxy containing hundreds of billions of stars. When these supernovae explode, they leave remnants, clouds of material that look like this. So this here is a supernova remnant imaged by Hubble. And actually there's lots of really interesting science in here because this material left over from these supernova explosions is actually enriched in heavy elements. So we actually know that as a product of the Big Bang, only hydrogen and helium and a tiny fraction of other elements were created. Really it was through supernova explosions and what we call stellar nuclear synthesis that all of the other elements were created including the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, the iron, all the things that go on to make our planet and even us. And so life is only really enabled by these types of explosions. If you'd like to learn more about this process, I have a second talk on the origin of the elements, which is featured on another YouTube channel called Sussex Universe. I'll mention this right at the very end as well. Now, the observations of these distant supernovae have actually revealed that the expansion of the universe is not behaving the way it should. The force of gravity should be making the expansion of the universe slow down, so gravity attracts mass. However, what these observations of supernova found was actually that the expansion was accelerating. And this just doesn't fit with our kind of naive model of the universe before this discovery. If a universe just contains radiation and matter, the expansion should be slowing down due to the force of gravity. But the fact that it's accelerating tells us that there's something missing in our model. 
So the, this discovery of an accelerating expansion was subsequently confirmed by several other experiments. The work of the original supernova teams was ultimately rewarded with the award of a Nobel Prize for Physics in 2011. Now today we attribute this accelerated expansion to the presence of something called dark energy, or at least most astronomers do. But exactly what dark energy is really remains unclear, and it's very much a term of ignorance. Okay, But it doesn't appear to just be a small feature of the universe, it actually appears today to dominate the energy content of the universe. So there is something which dominates our universe, which we really don't understand. And today, this is really intense focus of the astronomy and physics community. Now, at the other end of the scale, Hubble has also been used to study objects in our own solar system. Obviously, we've had a robotic probe since the late 1950s with the first missions to the moon. And with these robotic probes, we're now able to study the solar system in much more detail than Hubble can because we can get very close to them. But there are still to this day, some cases when Hubble has made a significant impact on our study of the solar system. So for example, Hubble can study wavelengths of light which robotic probes often can't. What I'm showing you here is an image of Saturn. And what we can see here at the poles of Saturn, both the North and South Pole, is this glowing feature. These are actually aurorae on Saturn. So these are caused by the interaction of Saturn's magnetic field with charged particles which are thrown off by the sun. And this is exactly the same phenomenon which generates the northern lights here on the Earth, shown in this picture. Now, we don't just see these on the Earth and Saturn. We also see them in Jupiter, as shown here by another Hubble picture. And we can see that they actually have very familiar features on Saturn and Jupiter, as they do here on Earth. They're made up of these often very thin bands with lots of structure in them. Now, Hubble can also observe objects which have not yet been visited by robotic probes. And so one example of this is this image here of Pluto, or the former planet Pluto and three of its moons. So we can see Charon right next to the very bright Pluto and then two small moons to the right. Now, actually, this is a little bit unfair because we have now visited Pluto, um, but it really kind of gives you the idea. Hubble has been used to observe many other objects in the solar system, typically small objects which haven't yet been visited. But of course, Pluto was visited only a few years ago by the New Horizons spacecraft, which transformed this image by Hubble into this image over here. And we see this beautiful heart-shaped feature on its southern hemisphere. So this is New Horizons' view of Pluto. In addition, Hubble is also able to observe objects at any time, while space probes may only be a particular planet for a relatively short period of time. In fact, there can be decades between space probe visits to a particular planet. So what this means is that we can't really observe rare or transitory events with space probes, but Hubble can. And I think probably one of the most famous of these events was that of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. Now, this was a comet which was discovered in 1993, not orbiting the Sun, but actually orbiting Jupiter. By the time of its discovery, it had been broken apart into lots of pieces by Jupiter's gravity, and was actually expected to collide with the planet in 1994. What you can see here is lots and lots of pieces of comet now being broken up. Okay, and so because of the tidal forces, the effect of Jupiter's gravity, the comet gets broken apart into this string of smaller pieces. Now, with the aid of Hubble and other observatories, we were able to actually observe these fragments hit the surface of Jupiter. And as they did, they left these huge visible marks on the planet's surface. So we can see these here towards the top left-hand corner of the image as these very dark marks. Now it's worth noting that some of these dark marks are approaching the size of the Earth. It was actually this event in the early 90s which triggered, I believe, um, the development of two films which came out only a few years later, Deep Impact and Armageddon, both of which dealt with an asteroid or cometary impact on the Earth. But Hubble, one of the great pieces of science that Hubble did was, was something that we hadn't anticipated before Hubble. Because Hubble was so much more capable once it was fixed than its predecessors, there was inevitably going to be things that it found that we'd never anticipated. But how do we find something that we haven't anticipated? Well, the way we do this is to point Hubble into as empty an area of sky as possible and just see what's there. 
if we stare for a long time, we're able to build up a deep image of what the universe looks like. And this experiment was first run in 1995. So Hubble embarked on its first deep field, the eponymous Hubble Deep Field. This patch of sky was chosen because it was relatively empty and it was believed to only contain a few stars or galaxies. And so this one patch of sky was observed for a, a very long period of time by Hubble, collecting lots and lots of light. And by doing this, faint objects could be detected. Now the result was the Hubble Deep Field shown here. Far from being empty, this image, this tiny patch of sky was full of galaxies, okay? Around 10,000 galaxies stretching back over much of the universe's history. We're able to see across the universe's history because the light from those galaxies takes some amount of time to reach us, okay? So light has a finite speed. It doesn't travel instantaneously across the universe. So this image is really as looking back in time. Now this experiment was repeated several times over the, fact, over the next few years, most notably with the Hubble Ultra Deep Field in 2004, with additions in 2009, 2012, and most recently the Frontier Fields project. Now each iteration has pushed deeper and further back into time. So this here is our most sensitive view of the universe. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field or the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. This contains thousands of galaxies extending across more than 90% of the universe's history. And this was really my first interaction with Hubble. I didn't work on Hubble during my PhD, or not directly, but as soon as I started my career in Oxford, now 11 years ago, I started working on this image and other images like it, trying to find some of the most distant galaxies in the universe. So just to highlight one of these galaxies. Down here, we have a little galaxy, which we're seeing when the universe was only a few percent of its current age. Okay, this is actually a relatively luminous galaxy in this period of the universe's history, but in this image, it just looks like a blob. Okay, but this galaxy here, this blob, this little red blob contains hundreds of millions of stars. More recently, Hubble has been actually turned towards identifying and studying planets around other stars, what we now call exoplanets. Now, Hubble was not designed to do this. It was not designed to find large numbers of these exoplanets. Other missions were instead. However, its unique capabilities have sometimes been used to directly image these systems and do other science that I'll mention in a second. So the image here is the environment of a star called Fomalot. So Fomalot, the actual star itself, would be normally sat in the middle of the image, but the light from the star has been blocked. Now, by doing this, we're able to see the faint features around the star. So the most prominent feature is this ring. And this bright ring is not an artifact here. It's actually a ring of gas and dust, basically what would maybe become either something like the Oort cloud in our own solar system, or maybe even condensed to form a planet. But a little bit more than 15 years ago now, observers, astronomers noticed that there was an object which appears to be moving. Okay, we can see this zoomed in in the bottom right hand corner, seeing it in 2004 and 2006. Okay, now by watching objects over time, we're able to infer the existence of something that looks like a planet. I say looks like a planet because there's been some recent news that this may not actually be a planet anymore. It may have been something more interesting to do with the collision between um, two smaller objects, perhaps on the way to creating a planet. But there's still lots of work to do here. But I think beyond actually just imaging planets and getting this kind of level of detail, there's something much more interesting that we're now able to do with Hubble, and in particular with its successors. Okay, and this is the ability to characterize the atmospheres of exoplanets. So when a planet passes between its parent star and the Earth, some of the star's light is blocked, causing a little eclipse. In fact, this is one of the main ways that we discover exoplanets in the first time, first place, by observing many thousands of stars over a long period of time, we can see these periodic dips in brightness. And so we can do this experiment from the ground, but we've most famously done this experiment with the Kepler Space Telescope, which was used to find thousands of new planets over the last decade. But what's really interesting is, if one of these planets has an atmosphere, which is not completely opaque, it's kind of semi-transparent or semi-opaque, some of the star's light will travel through that atmosphere. Some will be blocked by the planet's disk, but some will travel through the atmosphere. And even though it's a tiny fraction of the light, 
that still imprints a signature of that planet's atmosphere, of what that planet's atmosphere contains onto the star's light. And by actually analyzing the light of the star during these eclipses, we can actually find and work out to some degree what those planet atmospheres contain. And so this has been done a few times. And I think one of the really nice results was last year, Hubble confirming the presence of water in the atmosphere of the planet K218b. Now, what's interesting about this is that K218b is actually a relatively small planet, still a bit bigger than the Earth, but it also lies within the, the habitable zone of its parent star. So it might have the right surface temperature for liquid water, potentially even life. Okay, so this is now getting really exciting that we're able to do this. So on this note, let's look towards Hubble's future. So the retirement of the Space Shuttle program means that Hubble can no longer be serviced. Ultimately, its instruments will break and it will no longer be able to maintain its orbit. Exactly when this will happen is unclear. It could be tomorrow or it could be in a decade's time. We don't really know very well at the moment. It's likely to be somewhere in this range though. Let's look at some of Hubble's contemporaries though and see what's come since Hubble. So Hubble was obviously launched in 1990, 30 years ago. Since then, we've built a whole new generation of ground-based telescopes, including the Very Large Telescope, part of the European Southern Observatory, of which the UK is a member. Now, these are much larger than Hubble, and there's four of them, but they are on the ground. But Hubble is not the only space telescope. We've had several space telescopes, and in fact, there are several space telescopes still working. But two of the most relevant ones are Spitzer here, which is a relatively small telescope designed to look in the mid and far infrared. Now, this was actually only just recently turned off only a couple of months ago at the end of January after a very long career as well. And then we have the Herschel telescope. Now, because Herschel was a fine infrared telescope, it has to be cooled using liquid helium. Now this actually really dramatically limited its lifetime to only a few years. But Herschel is very close to our hearts here in the UK because there was lots of UK involvement in Herschel and lots of institutional involvement, in particular from places like Sussex and Cardiff and Edinburgh. But coming in the near future, and to some extent a successor of Hubble, is the Webb Space Telescope. So this is the James Webb Space Telescope, or just Webb, or JWST. And again, we'll see why in a second, but this is now a completely new design compared to Hubble. We see here that Webb has this large primary mirror, which is exposed, with a small secondary mirror that we can see the back of, and then this sun shield and communication system on the bottom. Now, like, Web, like Hubble, Webb is this big international mission being built by NASA, the European Space Agency, including us, and the Canadian Space Agency. On a smaller level, research institutes and universities from across UK, Europe, and the US all contributed towards the development of the spacecraft and its instrumentation. But even beyond that, thousands of astronomers across the entire world will use Webb in the same way they've used Hubble to answer a whole range of scientific questions. Webb has a mirror which is about five times more large than Hubble, or five times larger than Hubble. It's also got a whole new suite of more advanced instrumentation, right? And the whole mirror is coated in gold, which allows it to look much better in the infrared. Now, all of these things combined actually make it 10 to 100 times more sensitive than Hubble and Spitzer. But unlike Hubble, Webb is actually designed to operate almost solely in the infrared. So you can see Hubble here operates in the UV, the visible and a little bit of the infrared, whereas Webb really covers the near and mid infrared. This need to operate in the infrared actually influences many of the de design aspects of the telescope, but in particular, what the mirror is made of. So Webb is coated in gold, as opposed to Hubble and other telescopes, which are typically coated in aluminium. And the thermal properties of the telescope are also very different. Okay, so Webb has got to be moved away from the Earth, which is very warm, and has always got to keep it essentially bottom or back to the sun. But this infrared capability allows Webb to continue Hubble's scientific legacy, for example, by pushing further back in time through dust. So looking at the pillars of creation, but being able to look through the dust and to actually see the sites of star and planet formation and also measure the composition of alien atmospheres, potentially telling us whether there's oxygen, water, et cetera, in their atmospheres. 
Despite its many delays, Webb was on track to launch next year. But with the current crisis, the pandemic, it now remains unclear what the impact on Webb is going to be. I think in all likelihood, we will see a, a delay, but hopefully it won't be too long. But like Hubble, Webb will revolutionize our view of the universe. So this is just a picture of Webb um, in a clean room. You can see a, a technician uh, in the background, just to give you an idea of some of the scale. And what you're seeing here is Webb partly folded up. Now, the reason for this is that Webb, in order to fit on any of our rockets, has to be folded up several times in order to make it fit. So we couldn't take Hubble's design and simply scale it up. We simply don't have a rocket large enough with a large enough diameter to allow that. And so Hubble's design is kind of like origami. It all folds up. Again, there's another talk that I'll be giving soon on the Sussex Universe YouTube channel, all about exploring the universe with the Webb telescope. But due to the difference in wavelength coverage, Hub is, uh, Hub, sorry, Webb is arguably not the true successor of Hubble. So unlike Hubble, Webb doesn't have any UV and only marginal visible capability. So if we're looking for a kind of one-to-one one -one successor to Hubble, we're actually going to have to wait quite a long time. A potential true successor is the Large Ultraviolet Optical and Infrared Surveyor, or Louvoir. Now, this is very much just a concept being developed and studied by NASA and the European Space Agency. If it is taken forward, and there are no guarantees that it will, it will launch towards the late 2030s, maybe even to the early 2040s. And you can see an artist's impression of Louvoir here. It basically looks like a much larger version of Webb. And so that actually brings me towards the end of my talk. And just to wrap up some of the key points, Hubble was launched 30 years ago today. Since its launch, Hubble has been serviced five times, allowing it to maintain its position as one of the most productive and advanced observatories ever created. Even to this day, it remains one of the most in-demand observatories. Hubble has been used to tackle a whole range of science questions, spanning all the way from our own solar system, all the way to finding some of the most distant objects in the universe. Hubble will soon be succeeded, at least scientifically, by the Webb telescope due for launch next year, and in the longer terms, potentially by the Louvoir telescope, which will replicate many of its features. Just before I finish and, and start to answer questions, just like to advertise my own website, which includes more information about myself and links to other talks, but also this other channel called Sussex Universe, which we've recently launched down here at the university, which is a collection of talks by members of the, the physics and mathematics departments here in Sussex. And so I will just end there and ask that you send the questions to the Q&A and hopefully Lucinda will read them out to me. Thank you very much. It was wonderful to hear your talk. Thank you, Dr. Wilkins. We do have a few questions that have filtered in. So if you have a moment, go ahead and Add your questions to the uh, chat uh, box at YouTube uh, on our live stream, or um, I've got a few questions here already, uh, Dr. Wilkins, uh, with our Zoom participants. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read those out for you. And hopefully you remember this one's referring to a deep space photograph uh, that you had. It's from Roy Sandbach, and he asks, in your deep space photograph, the distant galaxy that you pointed out was red. Why, asks Roy, and he says, thank you. So that distant galaxy is red due to the effect of cosmological redshift. So we know that the further away something is, the, the faster it appears to be moving away from us. And a consequence of this is that the light emitted by that galaxy is actually pushed from the UV and the visible into the infrared. And so what you're actually seeing there is UV light, but because of the expansion of the universe, it's been shifted into the red, actually the near infrared in that image. So in that image, we wouldn't be able to see that galaxy with our own eyes. That red that you're seeing is kind of a fake color and it's actually just showing that there's very infrared, but we would call that galaxy red by virtue of it being in the infrared but it's all due to the cosmological redshift effect. Okay, thank you. Our next question is also from a Zoom viewer. Um, Kai Oho, he asks, uh, what is the best way 
to get a child of nine years old into space and astronomy without getting overwhelmed. Uh, schools don't re really cover it well enough. Um, so how's that? That's really that's a really difficult question. Um, I would say straight away, it, it really depends on the child. I have a nine year old myself downstairs who I, is interested in space, but obviously there's a bit of bias there because I'm interested in space. Um, I must admit, there's a couple of reasons why I got into astronomy um, around that age. Obviously, I'm, I'm a, only a couple of years older than Hubble. So it was really when I was around nine that I was first exposed to Hubble. So Hubble launched when I, I guess when I was six, but I started seeing these amazing images when I was kind of eight or nine, a little bit older. And that's one thing that drove me into, into astronomy and space science. But I actually, at the time, as I look back at it, the one thing that really got me interested in astronomy was actually a computer game, funnily enough. Um, and it was a computer game called um, Elite Frontier. So this was a game where you could fly around to different stars. But the difference in this game compared to other games was that the developers actually made a realistic universe. So you could fly to real stars, you could see realistic looking planet systems. And this always really intrigues me. So what I'm trying to get here is that I think for a child that age, and certainly if I look back at myself and I look at my son, um, making it fun um, is what I, the way that I got into it, not just these beautiful images from Hubble, but being exposed to it in kind of an indirect way got me thinking about, oh, why is that star that color? What does that mean? Is that interesting? That's kind of neat. Why are the planets like that? And so it was kind of a, yeah, get into it that way. It's, it's a very, very difficult question to ask. Obviously, there were, there were thousands of tremendous resources on the internet. There's lots and lots of websites from NASA and the European Space Agency and the Space Telescope Science Institute, which have lots of resources aimed at a whole range of different audiences. Um, again, my kind of impression of working with children of that age, including my own son and, and some other work that I do, looking for things that are interactive, now, interactivity is actually quite difficult in astronomy, obviously, because we take pictures and we do things. And maybe this is why the idea of this game came to me. But again, you can look and you can find interactive things online. Um, if, if your child was interested in being an astronomer in the future, um, things like learning to code is really, really great because that is a lot of our day jobs. And there's ways that you, you can use that to make things more interactive and fun. Um, you, you can actually go download some of the raw images from Hubble and you can play around with them yourself and you can make some of the beautiful images which I'm just showing you there. So apologies for that. Um, hopefully that answers the question a little bit. It's a really, really difficult question to answer because it really is very specific to the child. But there is some tremendous resources out there. Yeah, I would say um, as an education outreach officer for the RAS, uh, um, do a, a, a night sky watch, take them out to go look up at the, at the night sky. And now is a really good time. Um, the skies are really clear. We've had some really cold nights and some uh, less cloudy evenings here in the UK. And I've had some wonderful stargazing. Um, that's a, a really great. And one thing that I really enjoy uh, looking at the stars through is, a, is um, maybe not telescope, but maybe binoculars is really cool. So um, that's a nice easy way. Also, there's lots of really fantastic books out there on space and astronomy. Um, so read a bedtime story about space and astronomy would be really great. Okay. I don't know if we should mention the, uh, the Starlink satellites as well, Lucinda, given yeah. uh, their impact on astronomy. So if you just type in Starlink onto a, a Google search engine, you'll be able to learn about these constellations of, of communication satellites which have been launched. But we can see many of them at a time if you look at the sky at the right time. I think at nine o'clock tonight, so only, only around 40 minutes, if you go out, you might see a, a kind of chain of these satellites. I think hope, hopefully the, the sky is clearer where you are. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Yeah, good mention, because they have been out uh, just recently from the launch. Uh, we've been talking about them at RAS about um, seeing in the past uh, couple of nights. So a uh, really good one. So yeah, look up. Pretty simple way to get uh, kids inspired about space and astronomy. OK, thank you. Next uh, question I have also from Kai. 
Um, was wondering, and maybe you already saw this or answered it, um, how can one get access to the pictures in raw format to process them? So you mentioned about how you can get some, um, some of the pictures from Hubble and, and learn how to process them yourself. Yes, you can. So there are, there are services on the internet where you just need to sign up for free. Um, so the, probably the easiest thing to do is just to go to Google and type in raw Hubble images and you will find various different uh, services. Um, I'm, I'm just, so one of the acronyms is MAST and I'm just blanking on what MAST actually stands for, but this is a, a system used by the Space Telescope Science Institute where they host all of their images. Now the vast majority of images taken from Hubble are now publicly available. There's only a tiny fraction which have uh, a proprietary period, which is maybe up to a year. So it's only maybe a small fraction of images taken in the last year, which are not actually accessible. The rest of it is open to everybody to exploit. And there are lots of tools out there to allow even um, relative novices with coding to actually go ahead and do things. I mean, to be honest, you can even read some of these images into Photoshop, for example, and play around and make your own versions of the color images. So if you don't quite like the color balance in some of the images, you can read in the raw images and play around with them, which is a nice thing to do as well. And it's, it's very easy to get into and you can make your, your own version of some of these beautiful images, which I'm showing you. So with a bit of an assist for you there, Dr. Wilkins, um, I looked at MAST. It looks like it stands for Mikulski Archive for Space Telescopes. That's right, yeah. I, I always forget. So Mikulski is, um, or was a US Senator, I believe, who was a, a strong proponent for, for Hubble. Okay, excellent. So they can go, uh, I just look at MAST HST for Hubble Space Telescope and you're good to go. Okay, David Serrano asks, uh, with recent ground-based projects and new telescopes projected in the next years, do you think at some point we will be able to build telescopes that would be able to compensate the atmosphere negative effects? Yes, in fact, this is something that we've been, um, that the community have been working on for a couple of decades. There is a process called adaptive optics, which attempts to correct for most of the effects of the atmosphere. So just very loosely, what this does is we, we fire lasers into the atmosphere. And because we know what the laser light should look like, um, you can actually use what we know it should look like compared to what it does look like to instantaneously correct for the atmosphere. So this system is used on some of the largest telescopes today. And it's really, really going to be integral to the next generation of very large ground-based telescopes. So what we call the extremely large telescopes, which will be coming online in the next five or 10 years. But yeah, we're certainly working on that. Now, unfortunately, they, they, don't, they don't fully take account of all of the effects of the atmosphere. So for example, they're not really going to help you with the fact that our atmosphere absorbs lots of infrared and X-ray and UV. We can't get around that but we can correct for some of the kind of blurring effects via these systems. And so it's likely that, for example, the extremely large telescope, which is being built by the European Southern Observatory, which we're members of, this will have one of these systems and this will have a better image quality than Hubble and even than Webb, but it won't be able to probe into the infrared like Webb. Okay, good. Um, the next question uh, from Saik Abassi asks, space is our future and as Earth is becoming inhabitable, this is his uh, opinion, what's your take on it and how soon will we be able to find a habitable planet? It's an interesting question and I, I there's lots of, there's lots of really interesting issues in here. I mean, first of all, Obviously, anthropogenic climate change is a real thing that is going to make our planet less habitable than it is, certainly in many areas of the world. But certainly within our own solar system, we're never going to find anywhere which is, is as habitable as the Earth. Even if we, no matter what we did to the Earth, barring some kind of nuclear event, um, I don't think there's ever gonna be a strong motivation to get into the rest of the solar system, unless for example, the population grew dramatically. In terms of going out further into the universe, yes, with things like the ELT and with Webb, we might actually discover planets which are truly habitable, have the right combination of temperature, 
gravity, radiation, and chemical composition. But it's likely if we do find a planet with those right combinations, certainly if it has oxygen in its atmosphere in the right proportions, it might already have life. And I think at that point, although that planet might be habitable by humans, we really need to think carefully whether we should colonize that planet because it's very, very likely, even, even with the best of intentions, that colonization would be detrimental to any biosphere which already exists there. So my, my personal view for humanity's future is that I don't think we will be living on these alien planets, right? We might find barren planets and, and turn them into kind of fake Earths, okay? So terraform them, I think is the term. But I don't think we're ever gonna land on a, a planet with an alien biosphere and kind of colonize it. I don't think we should. I just, I can't see how we could guard ourselves towards destroying that. We should treat all of these planets as, as nature reserves for lack of a better word. It's a, it's a question that brings up really interesting things. And I mean, you could have hours long debate all about exactly this. Yeah, and I completely agree with you is basically just as we should be having more respect for our planet, whatever other planet we go to, we should continue having that respect, yeah. Uh, okay, another question from a person named A. Bond. Um, in the UK, what would be the best, most interesting observatory to visit? <laughs> um, so in the UK, the only... We do have a handful of visible observatories which are still doing science, although most of, our, most of the visible observatories doing science are now in places like Chile and Hawaii, where the sky is much better. We do obviously have a whole range of historical observatories in the UK, historical visible observatories in the UK. So obviously there is the, the Greenwich Museum in London, so the, the Royal Observatory of Greenwich. Um, there is the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh, worth visiting. And then the other one, which is, is very close to my heart because it's literally very close to me, is the Hurstman Zoo site. So this is the Observatory Science Centre in East Sussex. And this is actually where um, visible astronomy in the UK really existed for most of the, the second half of the 20th century. So after the Second World War, most of the kind of visible astronomy community was moved to the Hurstman Zoo site. Now today, Hurstman Zoo is actually a, a museum, a science center where you can visit some of the old telescopes. You can use some of the old telescopes on their observing evenings, but they also have a ded dedicated science center where there's lots of interactive exhibits and things. I promise I'm not being paid by them at this point. Uh, it's just a really great place to go visit. And it's a good part of our history. Beyond that though, what we have done for a long time in this country is radio astronomy. So we, we really led radio astronomy um, across the world since, since the second world war. So a lot of radio astronomy was a spin-off of technologies developed during the second world war, including radar and things like that. And so if you ever get the chance Go visit the Jodrell Bank Observatory just outside Manchester. It is they have a visitor centre? That is, you can see the huge, huge telescope there. In particular, the Lovell Telescope. They also have a music festival there each summer, which I think unfortunately has been cancelled this year. Um, but again, that's a great place to go visit. And there are a handful of other observatories around. Now, there's obviously lots of um, astronomy societies, amateur astronomy societies, all over the country. And you can get involved with your, your local one and there'll be lots of people there willing to show you their, their sometimes really large telescopes. So up to the size of a meter I've known amateurs have in this country. Um, and there's lots of open observatories in different universities as well if you just want to have a look at the night sky. But in terms of the really cool historical ones, I think Greenwich, Hurstman Zoo and then Jodrell Bank are the ones that really spring to mind. Those are great suggestions. and. I've been to the one, and I call it Hurstman So. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Hurstman Zoo. So Hurstman Zoo, okay. It's not pronounced how you would expect it. Okay. Um, and um, I, I've worked with Dr. Sandra Voss, uh, who's a science director there. And um, uh, it's an amazing place to visit because of those copper domes. They're just so beautiful and bright against a bright blue sky. Um, also, so one of our attendees at uh, on a Zoom call, um, uh, mentioned Kielder. I also went to Kielder last year, which was, it's a, an observatory up in Northumberland, which I would highly recommend. That's a good one too. Yeah, I've never been there, but I've heard about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a lovely experience and it takes quite a long time. It's in the middle of a forest, so you definitely have to take some time off uh, to stay the night. 
I would suggest anyway. All right, we have a, a question from um, seven-year-old uh, Sara who is uh, watching uh, with their parent and they ask, how long does it take to get pictures from Hubble to Earth? Good question. Not very long at all, actually. So it, it can happen within a few minutes of them actually being acquired. Um, but then the amount of time it then takes to get to the astronomers is a little bit longer. So there's all kinds of, of processing which needs to happen to them. But because it's all beamed electronically, it's actually done very, very rapidly. Um, and actually the, the longest period of time is, is kind of human intervention in the Space Telescope Science Institute. They kind of do some processing. They, they take the raw images and they, they improve them a little bit to make them more accessible to the astronomers. So we can, we can get them very, very quick. All right, so uh, Dr. Wilkins, uh, you're very popular right now. It is 8.30, just wanted to let everybody know, but we do have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven questions. So what do you want to do? I'm happy to keep answering questions for a few minutes, but I okay. do have to go get some dinner in about 15 minutes. All right, so let's, uh, let's pull through then. Um, so Serena asks, will any of these future space missions allow for shedding light onto the discrepancy in the value of uh, Hubble constant? Ah, so this is something that has emerged over the last couple of years, that, that there is a discrepancy in the Hubble constant. Um, so this is this thing that Hubble, the scientist, first measured all the way down in the 1930s, and that was one of the prime names for Hubble the telescope as well. And this number really tells us how quickly our universe is expanding today. Now, you can try and measure this in lots of different ways. And as our measurements have got more and more precise, two of the different ways are actually starting to disagree with each other by quite a long way. So this is becoming a big bit of a puzzle. And some cosmologists, some astronomers are now suggesting that maybe this is hinting at some new misunderstanding of physics. Okay, maybe it will somehow help to explain what dark energy is or dark matter. In terms of what role Hubble and Louvre will play in that, I think, to be honest, it's probably going to be relatively minor um, because they're not designed to really tackle these big cosmological questions. Certainly, they will allow us to find more of these stars, these Cepheid variables. So on one end of it, we'll be able to get better constraints. I think what will really help, though, is a whole range of other space telescopes, which are going to be launched in the next few years, which have much more specific missions. So these include the European Euclid satellite, which is going to be launched um, next year or the year afterwards, and then the US um, Wide Field Infrared Space Telescope, which should be launched in the next five or 10 years. Now, these two are, are designed to kind of say more about the, the universe on very large scales, whereas Louvre and Hubble, they're designed to do more um, study individual kind of smaller objects. They almost certainly will have an impact, but whether they'll solve the discrepancy, we don't know yet. Good question, though. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael asks, are the colors in the images real or imagined? This is a very, very, uh, very, very um, popular question. So the answer is, in a small number of Hubble images, the colors are kind of close to what you would see with your own eyes. So when we observe colors, that's because we have three different types of cells in our eyes, which are each sensitive to a different range of, of wavelengths, a different range of kind of light colors. If you think about the spectrum, one is sensitive to red light, one is sensitive to blue light, the other one's sensitive to green light. And our brains combine that information to make what we see as color vision. Now, in telescopes like Hubble, we do it slightly differently. We take an image of the same source, the same patch of sky, but using three different filters. And then we combine those three different images to make a color image. Now, there are filters which are kind of close to the kind of response of our eyes. And so in those cases, you do get an image which kind of would look like it would to your eyes. But I would say that most of the images that we see from Hubble, um, they're not true color. But at the same time, they're not imagined color. So the color there, it means something. So when you see something being blue or purple, 
that means that it's producing more blue light than red light. And that's interesting because that tells us something about the object. And so if you think about this in terms of stars, a blue star is actually a hotter, more luminous star than a red star. And so although many of the, the, the colors that we see in these images aren't true, they're not used to deceive and they're not used just for aesthetic purposes. They're actually used to tell us something about those objects that we're looking at. In particular, when we look at nebulae, when we see these vivid blues and reds, they're actually telling us about oxygen and hydrogen in those nebulae, typically anyway. So it's a little bit of a mixed answer. In most cases, it's not exactly what you'd see with your own eyes. In some cases it is, but virtually all cases we're trying not to mislead people, but actually do science based on those, those colors that we see. Thank you. I would say uh, we are missing a bit of light in your room because I think you're going darker and darker as the day goes on tonight. Yeah, I might go turn the light off in my, uh, <laughs> my room very quickly. Yeah, go ahead and I will say the next question. Uh, these are questions from our YouTube watchers. So thank you for joining us on our YouTube live stream. Today is our first day the RAS has um, actually done live stream. So we're really excited to be able to bring this to, to you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Florence uh, asks, what will be the final mission for Hubble? Um, well, Hubble won't be serviced again. Um, and it's very, very unlikely that there will be any further intervention. Um, at the moment, the exact future of Hubble is somewhat uncertain. So we don't know when it will actually die, but we could, um, we could choose to perhaps prematurely end Hubble's mission. So one thing that's a potential concern in the future is that if the, if the telescope breaks too much, it will tumble into the atmosphere in an uncontrolled way. And because it's so large, some bits of Hubble could actually make it down to the ground if this was uncontrolled. And so I think there's still kind of a desire that we don't let that happen and we prematurely end Hubble's life in order to give it a, a, um, a, a predictable kind of entry into the atmosphere where you're going to limit any type of fragments hitting the ground. Um, I, I think what's going to happen is that obviously the engineers, the technicians who, who work very closely with Hubble, they're going to continue monitoring the, the telescope. And when something breaks next, there will be a decision that's made about its future. My hope would be that we continue using it until the very last moment, because Hubble has some capabilities that we're not going to reproduce, um, potentially for a couple of decades. So in particular, it, it's UV and visible capabilities. We will lose them after Hubble dies. And although we, we gain more from Webb and we gain things from the new generation of ground-based telescopes, there are still some bits which are missing, in particular the UV. Okay. Hopefully you can see me better now as well. As yeah, more light, light really does help. Yeah. <laughs> I was relying okay. on a, a natural <laughs> light until now. Um, so uh, I think you answered also Katara's question, who is very similar, and they asked, um, will Hubble keep orbiting the Earth after its retirement? It will, but it will slowly it will slowly move towards the Earth um, unless it's pushed itself. There has always been this hope that there would be another mission to Hubble, um, maybe which didn't fix it, but actually just pushed it away from the Earth to preserve it. But I, I mean, my personal view on that would be it would still cost tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions to do that. And that money might be better spent supporting scientists or building a new mission, things like that. And so I think it, it, it's more likely that Hubble will be deorbited um, and will burn up in the Earth's atmosphere at some point in the next decade. So there's um I, there's two more questions about Hubble and then one for Spitzer and one for Webb. So I'm going to finish up with the Hubble questions first. Uh, um, Ellie from Cardiff, she says hi, and she wonders, is there still a way to volunteer for Hubble from home? Um. Oh, I'm not actually sure. So uh, probably the most popular way of actually getting involved from home working with, with Hubble data was the, uh, the Citizen Science Project Galaxy Zoo and, and its many spin-offs. I'm not actually sure which of those are still live. 
Um, but I'm sure a quick Google search would reveal which of those are still operating. My hope would be that when we've got web, for example, there would be some kind of a new version of Galaxy Zoo, which will be exploiting web images, getting members of the public to look at every single web image in detail to try and find things that the astronomers don't find, because that's proven to be really successful in the past. And we've actually found a whole load of interesting stuff that astronomers wouldn't have found by themselves. And so, I mean, I would hope that something like that will appear with, with Webb. And I'm sure the uh, the Galaxy Zoo people led by Chris Lintot over in Oxford and his many collaborators, I'm sure they'll be thinking about something like that. Uh, whether or not there's still a Hubble one going right now, I'm not sure. So you can go check out uh, Galaxy Zoo at zooniverse.org. Great. Um, okay, last uh, Hubble question here. Um, who decides, and this is from Chris George, uh, who decides what Hubble and other missions um, look at? Who gets to decide that? What's the point to tell us about? So the vast majority of time on both Hubble and Webb is open time. So what happens is astronomers, so scientists, we will get together in little teams and we will write a proposal where we say, this is what I want to look at. This is why, this is the question that I want to answer. This is why these observations will do that. And then we go ahead and we submit that proposal to, um, in Hubble and Webb's case, the Space Telescope Science Institute, who then assemble a panel of, of experts from across the world to assess every single proposal and choose the proposals that they think are the best. So this is peer review. So typically you have these, these panels, what we call a time allocation committee, who will read every single proposal, or at least every single proposal in their scientific area, and they will grade them and they will decide that way. Um, so this is how the vast majority of time on Webb and Hubble is allocated uh, through this process. Smaller amounts of time are given away in different ways. Um, and on other telescopes, um, it, it's done a little bit differently. So you have other smaller missions where they're just going to observe one particular feature. And that's decided in a little bit different way. But with Hubble and Webb, we astronomers, we, we write proposals typically every year. They get assessed and some of us are lucky and some of us aren't lucky. And it just goes like that. In fact, right at this moment, I should have been writing a proposal for the Webb telescope, even though it hasn't launched yet. But due to the current crisis, they've pushed back this proposal deadline. So I've now stopped writing it and, and done other things instead. Oh, well, well, I'm glad that it's allowed you to be here with us. Um, but yes, we'll get back to that soon enough. And speaking of the web, uh, someone asks, how will the web telescope protect itself from space debris when it doesn't have a shield? Um, so it essentially won't. Um, well, modulate the fact that we have this sun shield, which is kind of on the bottom of the spacecraft um, or on the back of the spacecraft, depending on how you think of it. Um, this won't really protect the spacecraft, so space debris will still impact that. It will slow some of the debris down. But, but there is relatively small amounts of debris at, um, at this location where Webb is going to be. That being said, it is impacts by small pieces of debris, which are going to limit its lifetime to about 10 years. Um, so Webb won't last as long as Hubble. It will last maybe 10 years. And that's through being degraded by little bits of debris, um, instruments breaking, um, cosmic rays hitting the telescope. But we, we've, we've had telescopes at that position, so we know what the environment is like. We know how much debris there is. And so we kind of have a probability, probabilistic model, which will tell us how long web should last. Now, of course, with all of these things, there is this horrible chance very early on in the mission that web could be struck catastrophically and it could cut the mission short. But the probability of that happening is deemed to be very, very low. So basically it doesn't protect itself. Um, we just don't think it's gonna get hit that many times in its kind of main lifetime for this to be a problem. Okay, last question here from John Osborne. It asks, is there going to be a successor to the Spitzer X-ray telescope? Um, Spitzer is actually an infrared telescope. So Spitzer operates at mid and far infrared. So actually Webb is more of a successor to Spitzer than it is to um, Hubble. In fact, Webb kind of sits between Spitzer and, and, and Hubble. Now, Spitzer's kind of longer wavelength or fine infrared capabilities. 
Um, there are proposals to, to reproduce that. Um, obviously, most recently, we have the Herschel Space Telescope. I know you mentioned X-rays in there as well, so I'll just answer that as well. There are two existing X-ray observatories. So there's Chandra and there's XMM. These are not observatories that I work on, so I might say something wrong here. Um, they've both been observing in the X-ray universe for, for um, many years now. Um, there is a planned successor from the European Space Agency called Athena, which again, I think is maybe 15 years away, if I'm right, uh, which should be coming. Um, there are successes for all of these missions. It's just that these missions take so long, are so expensive that these things take a long time and we, we will end up having gaps, unfortunately. Okay, well, let's let you get to dinner and um, to say thank you to you, Dr. Wilkins, for joining us. And if you haven't gotten enough Hubble, I don't know if you know this, but one of our um, attendees on Zoom uh, reminded us that tonight it, in about 15 minutes at 9 p.m. this evening on BBC Two, they're doing Hubble, The Wonders of Space Revealed, um, on an episode of Horizon. So something to eat, to watch while you're eating your dinner. Yes, exactly. I think that's going to be full of beautiful imagery, imagery from Hubble and some 3D images that they've generated as well. I've seen the trails for this. It really does look very nice. And if you do get a chance, you can try and have a look at the Starlink satellites if it clears up. I've just looked out of my window and it's looking a little bit cloudier here right now, unfortunately. Yeah, I think it is a bit hazy. Do you know what time they're um, due by? I think nine o'clock is actually when the main ones were due by. I think maybe actually some of them are supposed to be going about now, but with the main kind of group at nine o'clock. Do you know what direction in the sky that might be? I don't offhand. I want to say they would be emerging from the west and going civilly in an arc towards the east, but I might have that completely the wrong way around. <laughs> well, there's always looking online and doing a search. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. Very much thank appreciated. You for having me. Thank you for being with us. And thank you everyone for attending. And we're going to just give you, um, thank you so much and just bid you a very good evening. Take care. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.